things that you hate Let's talk about some things that are great He'd rather let the people know About the underrated classics of old Than bitching us about shitty games Like it's been done a million times before Cause he's the happiest gamer you've ever heard He's the happiest hand on earth He's the happiest Tony second earth He's the happiest video game nerd As human beings, we love nostalgia. When we're not pining for the good old days of our youth, we're somehow trying to beat time at its own game and make ourselves younger. And while like most healthy adults, I have accepted my adulthood. But I still hold very dear the days of my childhood. I don't know about you, but when I was seven, I couldn't wait for Friday after school, when I had two whole days to play with my toys, draw pictures, watch cartoons, and of course, play Nintendo. Playing retro games for me is like taking a time warp back to my adolescence, but no game embodies the essence of what it feels like to be a seven-year-old boy again, like Capcom's Little Nemo the Dream Master. A game where you get to be a bee, a frog, a fish, a mole? Travel through mushroom forests, swim through night oceans, fly to a ruined city in the clouds and dash through a house of toys? And use a magical scepter to thwart darkness and save a princess? Sounds like the product of a typical seven-year-old's imagination to me. This game's greatest feature is its undeniable charm, and while I can say that there are many games that take me back to the past, few truly make me feel like a kid again. It's the type of game you'll want to play on a Saturday morning still in your pajamas. To borrow the tagline from Wes Anderson's Life Aquatic, Little Nemo the Dream Master, this is an adventure. It is the year 1909, and our hero Nemo is sleeping soundly one night in his New York home. That night, he is awakened in his room by a strange woman, who extends an invitation by Camille, the Princess of Slumberland, to be her playmate. Like any seven-year-old boy, Nemo is at first hesitant to go and play with a girl. But after receiving the gift of candy, he agrees to come, as long as he doesn't have to kiss her. And that's pretty much it for the story. And that's all this game really needs. I mean, one of the great things about this game is that it never tries to be more than it needs to be. A fairy tale. There are many unique things about this game that set it apart from the rest. One is that the goal is not just to get to the end of the level. You must scour each huge world and find all the keys to unlock a door. This means levels are less linear, with branching paths and hidden passages to explore. This design was very uncommon for games back then. But most keys are hidden in places too high or too small for anyone to get to. This is where your candy comes into play. Around the level there are many nice creatures. These creatures will not attack you, but if you feed them candy, they'll let you ride them. This idea is kind of similar to Mega Man, because each creature has a special power and you must use each of them to find the keys in the level. And as levels get harder, they also get bigger, and you are forced to become more resourceful with the animals available to you. Now, if all this sounds weird and therefore dumb to you, you're sort of missing the point. Yes, Little Nemo is very different, and all this may sound like a dumb concept for a game, but then, you're not really thinking like a seven-year-old. The strange environment, surreal setting, and fairy tale like story all fit perfectly when framed in the imagination of a child. And once again, it is this undeniable charm that makes Little Nemo one of the most enjoyable gaming experiences ever. Now, this isn't exactly a kid's game, or at least not what you'd think of as a kid's game today. This game is hard, deceptively hard. In fact, this one is more for the adult gamer who's still a kid at heart. The concept and environment are all very cutesy, but don't let that fool you. This one will have you screaming at the TV, shouting bad words your mother told you to never say. Fucking shit! Derek! Sorry, Mom. Wait, what are you doing in my apartment? Huh? 
Uh, so, okay, all right, yeah. There are a couple things about Little Nemo that make it really hard. For example, even the friendly animals can hurt you. Some levels have no checkpoints, the candy is really your only weapon and you can't kill anything with it, and when riding certain animals, you cannot attack at all. But it's these little fuckers that take the cake, the float fiends. If you've never played this game, you simply have no idea what frustration truly means. Just imagine, if you will, the birds from Ninja Gaiden coupled with the unrelenting respawn time of the Medusa heads from Castlevania, and you have one of the most infuriating enemies in video game history. The only way to get rid of them is either to kill them or let them float to the bottom of the screen. This means you can't outrun them. If you run to the left or to the right, they just follow you. They won't leave you alone. And right when one leaves the screen, another one immediately spawns to take its place. They're just so fucking unrelenting. You will hate these things. God, this game is hard. And you know what? I'm glad. This is a real game. There were no kids games when I grew up. Hell, I grew up on games like this. Contra, Mega Man, Castlevania, Journey to Silius, Star Tropics. Hard games. And you learn life lessons from these games. You learn what hard work and determination can do, and what a real challenge was. None of this soft, ratchet and clank shit. They weren't afraid to give us a challenging game back then. And you know what? They're better games because of it. I can still go back and play them today because they're not some watered down, don't want to hurt the kids self-esteem shit. Real games were real hard, just like real life. Now in terms of how this game looks, sounds, and feels, well, see for yourself. Capcom was arguably the greatest third-party developer on the NES. And Little Nemo is just one of many titles that feature striking graphics, super tight controls, and awesome music. So, if you're familiar with any of Capcom's titles from this era, you know what to expect. So even with its deep difficulty and frustrating parts, Little Nemo is still a fantastic NES classic. Its soundtrack, graphics, story, and setting all come together to give the game an undeniable charm. This game captures the feeling of the limitless bounds of a child's imagination, much like Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes. And this game is yet another with a truly fascinating history, so get ready to learn something. Little Nemo the Dream Master is actually based on an animated Japanese film called Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. It shared both American and Japanese directors and producers, but was made in Japan. An interesting fact is that even though Vampire Hunter D was the first anime conceived with an American release in mind, and Akira was the first anime given a theatrical run in America, Little Nemo was the first Japanese cartoon to be given a national theatrical run in America, where it garnered critical acclaim. In spite of this, however, the film failed to be profitable in theaters and sank into obscurity. Which is really a shame because it has some of the greatest non-Disney, non-Miyazaki hand-drawn animation I've ever seen. And the English voice acting ain't half bad, especially with the scene-stealing voice work of Mickey Rooney as a voice of Flip. Another noteworthy fact is that Nancy Cartwright, famous for the voice of Bart Simpson, has a small cameo in the film, and it is her character that appears in the intro of the NES game. So, when you watch that intro, just imagine that's Jay Sherman's sister talking. When Adventures in Slumberland came to VHS, it was trimmed, probably to make it an easier sell for the children's home movie market. The VHS runs a little over 80 minutes, whereas the theatrical and DVD cut run at just over 100 minutes. This makes sense, since just like the game, the movie is more for adults, still very much in touch with their inner child and not really for kids. I find it doubtful that most kids could sit through the entire 100 minute DVD. And speaking of the DVD, Adventures in Slumberland had a very limited run and has been out of print for years, and now goes for anywhere between 50 to 100 dollars. The VHS and Laserdisc go for much less, but who wants those old things? And interesting still, the movie and the game are all based on American artist Windsor McKay's groundbreaking surrealist comic Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland, which ran in newspapers like the New York Herald and New York American from 1905 to 1913. So interesting and influential was his life and work, I simply didn't know where to begin when I prepared this review. Suffice to say, the life and work of Windsor McKay, whose stunning animation work predates the heyday of Disney by some 20 years, is truly fascinating, and if you have any interest in entertainment history, art, comics, or animation, I encourage you to look him up. He was pretty much the Bill Watterson of his time. Because his work is so old, it's all public domain, so head to your favorite search engine and learn something about one of America's greatest forgotten entertainers. Okay gang, well, that's it for this episode. I leave you now with the words of Mr. Tom Stoppard. If you carry your childhood with you, you will never become old. Cheers.
chill in your pajamas playing video games. No, mom. <laughs>